I want to give a very warm welcome to William Halal. Hello. The greatest Bill. Uh, it is really great to have you here. Yeah, I, I thank you, uh, Alethea. That's very kind of you. Uh, I'm going to moderate the uh, next session, which uh, is by Rick Davies. Rick is going to talk about his system he calls PAR EVO, Participative Evolution. I, I think that's what that stands for. Is that right, Rick? Um, yeah, broadly speaking, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I make a request there that you only read out the first line of my bio, because otherwise we'll be here for a while. Um, and, and you can refer people to the bio, the full bio on the website if people are interested in finding out more about it. Sorry, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have your bio, Rick. I'm sorry. Well, that solves that problem. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe you want to do it. Could, could you do it? Introduce no, yourself. I, yeah, oh, I, I will. Let me introduce you, Rick, and then I will. One line only. Okay. Okay, so you go, please. <laughs> no, no, you, 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 if you can see it, you can just read the first line. I don't take your job away from you. <laughs> Right, so uh, Dr. Rick Davis is an experienced evaluator and developer of evaluation tools. Okay, read that's good. Read that again, <laughs> Say it again, Alethea. Okay, once again, so Dr. Rick Davis is an experienced evaluator and developer of evaluation tools. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm an evaluation consultant and I've been working for international aid agencies uh, for about the last 30 years. And one of my things is developing tools and methods. I think that probably will do. Good. Uh, why don't you tell us about uh, uh, the, uh, the topic a little bit before you get into it? Um, well, um, can I share the screen and just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the background of how, it, how we got there uh, before going into the presentation. Is, is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we can do this. Uh, share screen and I'm going to look for and uh, that's the wrong slide sorry bear with me there we are and I'm just going to Okay, so basically this is a presentation about a, a web-assisted process, participatory process for the exploration of alternative futures, and its history is that it, the design, the idea came out of some PhD field work in Bangladesh in the 1990s when I was doing uh, research on organizational learning and NGOs, and I developed the idea a little bit at that time, then put the idea aside, and about two or three years ago decided to give that idea some more attention and it, with the help of a local computer software company got the idea written up in the form of computer code to make it uh, workable over the internet and uh, usable by people scattered all around the world, not necessarily just simply in a workshop, face-to-face -face workshop. Is that sufficient as a bit of background? Yeah, that's a good introduction. Yes, thank you. Okay, so basically I'm going to explain how it works and the details of it and where it's going and uh, how it's different perhaps from some other approaches. So Parevo is, um, a participate, is about the participatory evolution of future scenarios, although you can also use it to develop alternative past histories as well. And this you know, diagram on the right-hand side, I'll just explain what it is because it captures the whole idea. So the nodes in this diagram are short text descriptions of events, paragraphs of events. And the branches in this diagram are sequences of paragraphs. In other words, storylines describing extended sequences of events. And the tree structure is basically a whole set of storylines that have been developed. And the columns represent different iterations, like growth cycles in a tree, for example, different iterations. And those iterations represent consecutive periods of time. So when you look at this tree structure, we have a, a paragraph at the beginning on the front page of a book where a story begins. But then there are, in this case, 10 different versions of that story that take off 
in the first iteration, but in the next iteration, some of those versions are ignored, some are continued, and some are continued by more than one person. So the storyline branches um, into two branches. We've got three examples of that. And then in, in the subsequent uh, iteration, uh, some, some other storylines die out again, some are continued and some branch out. And so the metaphor here is very clearly one of an evolutionary process of some storylines surviving and proliferating and others dying out. That's the core idea but how is it actually implemented? So this is uh, the web interface that you will see, and it, it shows a completed exercise that was carried out um, about what would happen in post-Biden uh, election America in 2020. And it looked at a period of time spanning the next, I think, three years. And we had about 10 participants. And you can see on the left-hand side, so at the top, there is guidance given to the participants, uh, which is provided by a facilitator. On the left-hand side, you can tree, see a tree structure, which is a more complex version of what I just showed you. And in that tree structure, there are some storylines that are surviving and some that die out. And the one on the left, which is highlighted, the text of that storyline is shown on the right-hand side, and each of those alternative colored panels in the storyline represent different paragraphs added in subsequent iterations. On the bottom left-hand side, there's also a panel where participants put their evaluations of these storylines at the end of the exercise. There's also a search field at the top where people can put in keywords and look for keywords in the different storylines that might be of interest to them. There's a capacity to provide comments on the different storyline contributions as they develop. And down the bottom, there is a space for adding the new contribution in the next iteration. So that's basically the interface that the user sees. The facilitator who runs the exercise has a more complex interface, and I certainly won't show that to you today. So when it comes to designing a Power Evo exercise, the facilitator has a number of choices. They have choices about what kinds of participants to involve, what sort of guidance to give to the participants during the exercises, how many iterations or time periods to cover, and what sort of evaluation questions to involve and people to involve in, in, the, in that evaluation stage. I've left all the details there. I won't read through the details there, but there are a number of design choices. That means each facilitator can tune the design of their exercise to fit their particular needs. So far, we've run about, uh, I think about uh, 16 exercises. Three of these were run before the app was developed using a, a more cumbersome process. And the other 13 have happened since the app was developed a year or so ago. And these are largely been sort of beta testing exercises, or some, although some of them have been serious, some have been part of uh, evaluations of UNB volunteer program, Kenyan pharma field trials, and uh, the treatment of gender in a UN agency. And more recently, and coming up shortly, is a quite serious study on biotechnology risks, the uh, alternative futures perspective on biotechnology risks. Uh, the number of participants has ranged from about six to 15. And um, these have been from these various sources that I've listed here. We've had between seven and eight iterations per exercise, uh, covering time periods from two to five years, but there's no reason why these could not be longer. And usually it takes between two and five days per iteration because the participants are usually scattered all around the world and you want to give them time to uh, read and respond to uh, the contributions of the previous iteration. So how does Paribo compare to other scenario planning approaches? Firstly, there are typically a lot more scenarios. Uh, the one you just saw there had 10 surviving storylines, each of which is, is a scenario about the future. And also there are a number of non-surviving storylines which are also important. The next point is that uh, Parivo is a very narrative first approach. Then you get into analysis, including looking at drivers of change rather than the other way around, which seems to be a more dominant practice of doing analysis of uh, drivers of change and then developing um, scenario narratives afterwards. The process is anonymous. Participants do not know who each other are, but it is still a participatory process because people are choosing uh, to build on each other's storylines and, and according to their interests and the development of those storylines. 
And finally, there's a big emphasis on evaluation of those storylines at the end of the process. And this is a preeminently a participatory evaluation, one that looks both at the process uh, whereby people have contributed to the storylines and the products, the contents of those storylines. And I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. So these are some of the evaluation questions which we ask people. We ask people to identify what they think were the most and least likely to occur storylines, which were most and least desirable. We also give them less structured, open-ended questions, asking them to do pile sorting of storylines into ones, the, into groups they think are the, representing the most significant difference between all the storylines. We ask people about what is surprising in the storylines and what is surprisingly omitted from the storylines. We ask them about how optimistic and pessimistic their storylines were and those of the others. And we ask them about agency, the extent to which they think they will have an effect on the events described and how much the events will in fact affect them. So this is an example of um, a plotting of the results of the likelihood and desirability ratings. And the points in this scatter plot are representing all the surviving storylines. And <clears throat> this, should prompt a series of questions, including what types of storylines are missing? Are there some spaces in this scatter plot which are completely empty? Notably, for example, here, there are very few stories that are significantly both likely and desirable. The other thing we look at is the extent to which the judgments about the storylines are contested. These are the red ones, which are quite a few in this particular example. We also try and break them up into categories of storylines, and uh, there are four which I'll talk about shortly in the next slide. And the other possibilities of using other dimensions to plot the storylines, for example, how sustainable the events are and how equitable the events are. Very timely, I think. Um, so when we're looking at different types of storylines in that scatter plot that you just saw, we've got four broad categories. Uh, the first is undesirable and likely, where the focus should be on risk and how they can be inhibited or mitigated. And then we've got storylines which are desirable but unlikely, and there we're looking at opportunities and how they can be enabled or capitalised. We've got desirable and likely storylines, which at the very least <clears throat> could be used to update any prior explicit strategies we've got about dealing with the future. And then we've got undesirable and unlikely, where at the very least, again, we should revisit these judgments to make sure that we actually did make sound judgments about those things. We can also do uh, some quite sophisticated content analysis using the keyword search facility in the app. Uh, looking at the differences between uh, surviving and extinct storylines, but also how different keywords cluster um, across the whole exercise, but also um, to what extent they occur in, in early uh, iterations of the storyline versus late, late iterations. We can also look <clears throat> at the structure of participation. There are people who um, who are essentially what I call leading. They're developing, their, they're adding to their own storylines, but some people are adding to theirs. We've got other people who are following. They're not really, they're mainly just adding to other people's storylines. We've got some people who just build on their own storylines and nobody adds to theirs. And we've got other people who build on other people's storylines and other people build on theirs. And the re interesting research question here is, what is is there such a thing as an ideal mix of these patterns of participation in terms of generating uh, a good uh, exercise result, for example, one that has a, a rich diversity of storylines? So what should we be thinking about when we're trying to uh, evaluate uh, what's happened after the exercise? These are some of the questions I'm thinking about at the moment, which is, uh, what do a wider population of observers think about the storylines? And in the case of the UNV volunteer scheme, they were able to canvass the opinion of over a thousand UNV volunteers on the storylines about what they thought about those. <clears throat> we can also ask participants about what they did differently after the exercise. And in this case, very open-ended, most significant change type questions are appropriate. And we can also ask what happened in reality, not in order to, to test whether a forecast was correct, which is not what this is about, but really to identify any gaps in our ability to think about uh, possibilities. Why didn't we think about that possibility if it did occur and we hadn't thought about it? 
So in summary, what are the objectives? And almost in summary, what are the objectives of this whole uh, platform? There are two levels of objectives here. One is what you might call exercise level objectives. And here we've got cognitive objectives which relate to futures literacy, increasing people's skills to think about the future. And we've got behavioral level objectives which is uh, enabling organizations to be more adaptive in the light of uncertainty. And then at the platform level, which I'm responsible for, because those that the exercise ones are the objectives and the responsibility of the facilitators, at the platform level where I'm responsible, I'm interested in accumulating data across multiple exercises to identify <clears throat> what sort of variations in design parameters affect the types of exercise results that are generated. And finally, <clears throat> looking into the future of Parivo itself. Um, these are some of the things that I'm looking at. One is the possibility of scaling up people's participation by engaging more people as observers and more people as commentators, as distinct from just the contrib contributors who are building the storylines. Um, the possibility of uh, exploring gamification, where we make it clear to people um, how well they're doing in terms of other people adding to their storyline, and there's a, an option already being built there. Uh, giving more attention to extinct storylines because the more uh, iterations you have, the more extinct more extinct storylines accumulate. And <clears throat> probably most importantly of all, more post evaluation discussion of what are the implications for action. What should we do about uh, these storylines given our evaluative judgments of those? And I think I will stop at that point. And I will open, make sure I can see the chat line. Right. Okay. Well, that is uh, thought provoking. Let me see if I if I understand this. I'm going to uh, sure I'll tell you what I what I got from this. Not so. There is a platform, a uh, web based system that mm -hmm. does all this. Is that right, Rick? That's right. Yeah, it does it with my help as a as a uh, admin in the background. And with the exercise for the facilitators in the foreground, and all of the all of the participants uh, work on uh, a laptop or something, so they they uh, work on on the same platform. That's correct. Although I should say the first exercise of this kind was carried out in a school classroom in Wales in 1996, using a blackboard and post-it notes. Oh, I see. Yeah, and uh, and who who moderates this or who, who leads this, Rick? Okay, so there are three basic participant types of people involved. The admin person, who's me, uh, a facilitator is someone who wants to run a participatory scenario planning process. Um, so, that's for example, client, sorry? Uh, that's the client, I guess. Yes, that's the client. Uh, well, no, uh, not necessarily. Um, in some cases, for example, with a think tank here in London, someone from the client organization acted as the facilitator and the nice. participants were other members of staff in that organization. But someone in that organization took the lead of taking on the facilitator role. It's conceivable you could have a, a third part. Well, for example, in some evaluations, we've had evaluation team members as the facilitators and the participants were uh, were the people from the program being evaluated. These were UND, UNV volunteers with the participants, but the facilitator was a, a independent third party evaluator. I see, yeah. And, and then uh, the participants uh, offer their thoughts and, uh, and then that establishes the the, uh, the different storylines, depending on what people offer as an initial point of departure, uh, I guess. The, the original, the seed of the story is written by the facilitator, and every addition to that, which is consciously de developing an imagined storyline going thereafter, is by the participants. These are not just thoughts. They're, what people are doing is accumulating a, a, a story that's developing over time. They're not just a series of um, miscellaneous thoughts. There's got to be some, they're, they're building on a storyline and saying what's happened next. Right. And a facilitator makes sure that uh, there is that continuity. Yeah. And other things like, for example, most importantly, you want to discourage people from um, making humorous contributions because that it's very entertaining, but it totally derails the process. Oh, I see. Yeah. So th this is uh, very thought provoking. And so the, the group uh, spontaneously 
develops these this multiple uh, lines of thought scenarios, mm -hmm. and, and you can see where they go. Yeah, and uh, then uh, and then they evaluate the each scenario, don't they? Basically, yes. One of the questions which we pose to the participants at the end is looking at the ten surviving storylines. Which of those do you think right. is most likely? Which is right. least likely? which is right. most desirable and which is least desirable. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I've got some, there's some other questions here from uh, someone else as well, if you, if you want me to attend to them. Yes. But please go ahead with other questions if you want to. No, let's hear from other people. Uh, so I think there's, there's one here from Annette. Um, the first question is the applicability to a 10 year time horizon. In principle, no problem. Um, you would need to think about how many iterations you want and what time period each iteration was going to cover. Probably if you were trying to cover a 10 year time period, your iterations would be more like one year each rather than three months or six months each because you'd have too many iterations and you might be stretching the people's tolerance for the amount of time required. Mm. Um, accommodating the different types of change punctuated and non non-linear um i think that's well within the reach uh, of people uh when they're writing each paragraph for each iteration is you know sometimes people will say actually nothing happened um you know and and they will make a point of emphasizing that at this big, big meeting that was held in the previous iteration nothing happened thereafter okay that's a legitimate part of a storyline um, and in other circumstances, you can obviously you can imagine people writing more dramatic sudden changes taking place. Uh, how is the context and trends factored into the storyline? Um, give me an example of that, if you could, Annette, if you can show sure. your audio. Yes. Um, uh, you know, typically uh, in the, the, the arena, we work with the steep trend model, which is basically kind of so what you can imagine in the way of trends, macro trends, more local or micro trends, and steep is social technology, environment, economy, and policy. And, and as, as levers for change, forces for change, results of change, um, influencers of change. And, you know, since I, I teach uh, foresight, you know, this is always the one of the heavier lifts that you have to do is to get uh, participants to take a very broad mindset to how mm -hmm. the world is working or not working around them. And and because your participants are only coming in with what they they know. And and many times many people only have a a, a limited frame of, of knowledge or narrow narrowed by their per careers or their where their their age or where they're at in their lives. So um, you know, one of the biggest challenges is to get people to think outside their box um, and understand the dynamics of the world around them. That's a good question. I think there are two possible responses here. One is that in principle, there's no reason why you couldn't give a briefing to all participants, uh, which was a briefing by people with some expertise on major, uh, major trends that are being anticipated, for example. Uh, and that would hopefully then influence the participants in the way they uh, develop their storylines. But up to now, uh, we've almost done the reverse. We've focused on getting people to express their views of the future based on their current understandings. And then after that, with the aid of the evaluation, to identify the strengths and weaknesses of their current mode of thinking. So it's, it's a more sort of ethnographic, um, you know, starting from where people are at type approach, but with the possibility of doing serious analysis of driving trends and that w amongst the completed storyline. So I, I think both possibilities are there, but there is, a, I think, a bit of a bias towards the latter at the moment. Um, I just want to dovetail on that by um, reminding us of the what's called the futures cone. And the cone is at the the biggest you can have is sort of the realm of the possible, what's imaginable. Uh, many times we will even include science fiction. And then it narrows to the center, which is kind of the extrapolation or the status quo future. It's what people incrementally see happen um, mm -hmm. based on some logic or linear, understand linearity. <coughs> and, and then in between the, the, the that is the 
the the plausible, you know, where you start mm -hmm. almost science fiction and, and going mm -hmm. into where uh, is there mo momentum or a rational reason for it and. Um, and typically we stay a lot in the plausible when we do scenarios because that's, that's where we want people to feel comfortable about being aspirational. So my question is if you, you know, because what I do is I get into, well, what the heck is change? Step increase, decrease, exponential, punctuated equilibrium. Still, that is a heavy lift. <laughs> Involved, you know, but so my, so my, you know, the thing here is how we, how successful we can be in breaking people out of their mindset, uh, not not just narrowness, understanding of the world, but their their narrowness and understanding the dynamics of change, the willingness and ability to think imaginatively into the into the possible. Yeah, um, I think that's well. That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think where one of the questions I've been uh, posing to myself is what is an ideal outcome from a Parivo exercise? Mm -hmm. And I, I think my current position is what I'm looking for in an ideal Parivo exercise is a diversity of storylines. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a diversity of storylines, then when people are thinking how they're going to respond to those, the more diversity there is, the more prepared they will be for uh, ad adapting and responding to uncertainties. However, that begs the question of how do you define a diversity of storylines? And mm -hmm. the, there are various measures or metrics for diversity uh, coming primarily from the field of biodiversity, which are applicable in this area. But it does partly depend on your mental uh, framework through which your, for example, that cone that you're describing. Um, if you if you ask yourself how, in fact, would you map storylines into that cone, and it depends on the sort of your perception of the axes, so to speak. For example, with that one of those plots there, we looked at probability and desirability. But I said we could have a totally different scatter plot, which was looking at sustainability versus um equity and when we plot the storylines there they might be all bunched up in in a corner to do with unsustainable and unequitable i.e something looking like the current world and in in that plotting we would very clear very see very clearly some big empty spaces and we would have we'd recognize our failure to, to think in sufficiently diverse terms about the, the future possibilities but it does depend on that mental framework the, the choice of axes in that scatter plot yeah, I can see this is very uh, a very flexible method. You could do lots of different things with it. Let me ask you this: In the ideal situation, would the uh, the, the participants reach a decision? Uh, this is an work? interesting question because people have said, um, you know, how do you how do you develop a consensus in, in this area? And this is not it's not like Delphi where you're trying to construct a, a, a consensus. What we're looking for here is a diversity of storylines. What we are looking for, though, is to identify uh, where areas of agreement and disagreement over, over the nature of those storylines. So in terms of probability and desirability, we can quite clearly identify where there is agreement and where there is disagreement. And both of those things are important. When, when there's agreement, we can then start thinking about, well, how, do we, how could we adapt to that particular storyline in reality? Where there is not agreement, then it raises really important issues of why are we disagreeing about that particular storyline and that ideally should be worked through. So uh, consensus is not an objective uh, uh, in terms of which storyline, well, it's not really an objective, but it still is attended to when we're looking at evaluation judgments. But yeah, but still, do, do people uh, often reach a decision? Do they choose one of the, one of the storylines to pursue? Um, people will agree on the status of different storylines being desirable, undesirable. They will agree about that. But the aim with the questions is not to say, right, we're going to follow that. Well, sorry, with the exception of storylines which people say are desirable and likely, when people agree on that, they have agreed, yes, that's where we should go. But in terms of extracting value from the exercise, it would be foolish to then ignore the undesirable but likely stories 
and the unlikely but desirable stories because both of those have got, as I said earlier, either risks or opportunities, which really makes a lot of sense to give attention to those possibilities, to either realise them or inhibit them. So you not only want to know about where you're going and have agreement on where you want to go, but those it's like looking at the side windows of a car to the risks and opportunities on either side. Rick, so, can... go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, Rick, I just want to pick on that deeper analysis using the, the preferability and desirability question, because we ask that all the time. And it's a very it's common a very... question. Yeah, it is, but also people diverge, and people will think the most preferable is the the is the lily, you know. Uh, so, so, but what I appreciate is how you've taken that question and put it, it, made it a much more rigorous evaluation question that is easily embedded any in any scenario foresight uh, workshop or uh, corporate scenario development process, and that. Um, you know, just to dovetail on the last um, uh, session, um, this is why we, we've been working with Rick on the task force, because he can show us the points where foresight practitioners can readily start to assess their work. Um, and, uh, but I'd like to get up a step further than a lot of practitioners will take on this particular uh, typical question. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm, I have another question here. Uh, the uh, the story could doesn't have to include strategic choices. It could just uh, focus on outcomes, on on environmental uh, outcomes, things that are likely to happen, rather than strategies. Is that right? It could include strategic choices as well. I presume. Think about the storylines literally as a novel being written. Right. Paragraph by paragraph, chapter right. by chapter. Novels right. have characters, they have settings, they have activities. Right. Sometimes they may be at the international level, sometimes it may be very parochial neighbourhood level. In these right. exercises, people can choose whether they want to talk about country level uh, events or neighbourhood level of events. And basically what I do try and encourage people is Tell a story in relatively concrete terms. If you're talking about countries, name them. If you're talking about organisations, tell us about the organisation. Don't just tell the story in very general terms because, A, it won't be a very readable, won't be very persuasive, but it also uh, enables judgments about likelihood and desirability and sustainability and equity a lot easier when, when the storyline is described in, in fairly concrete, non-abstract terms. Yeah, Have you I, read I, an I, abstract I, story? Right, I understand. Uh, the thing I'm trying to uh, tease out, though, is uh, the story can contain, I, I presume, mm. both uh, environmental effects, that is, changes, the things that the organization has no control over, and absolutely. choices, and tr strategic choices. They can both yes, absolutely, power. yeah. In fact, that is extremely common. Right, and how do they? How do you measure uh, consensus or the lack of consensus? On the, for example, likelihood of desirability is just literally counting votes. Oh, I see. Okay. Rich, so. I just have one more. Mm, sure. Um, I'm uh, a concern I have is that people fall too readily in um, storylines, conventional storylines, um, the hero's journey, for example, by Joseph Campbell, um, and they lived happily ever after you know, the, a la a, a fairy tale, or the detective or murder mystery who done it and we solved the crime at the end. So how um, how do we do, do integrate the the, the unexpected, the, the plot twist, the the, the we I, I think that's a great that? question. I would I would like you to have a look at some of the completed storylines and ask the question, are these storylines slipping into genres, into uh, stereotypes way too quickly, or is the opposite the case? In fact, uh, that they're not. And my gut level feeling is that they're not, but it would be really interesting to have an independent view on that. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love a good story. I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> because, because these storylines generally are composite developments uh, and sometimes branching, uh, you know, one person might be wanting the storyline to go in a particular direction, but somebody will then add a paragraph which said, but unexpectedly X happened. 
and the storyline will sort of shoot off in a sort of a slightly different direction. Um, so um, the, if one person was each developing their own storyline, I think the risk that you were describing of getting into a, a limited number of genres and, and that uh, would be much higher. And I suppose uh, uh, storylines can merge uh, as well as, as diverge. That's an interesting okay. question. At a literal level, they don't. But undoubtedly, when people are writing their contributions, they're looking across the previous storylines and they're borrowing ideas from adjacent storylines. And it's a bit like uh, gene transfer in populations of bacteria. Um, there's a lot of horizontal um, <laughs> transmission of information uh, going on, I think, in a power evo exercise. People do borrow and, and, uh, and, and reuse ideas from other storylines. Nice uh, analogy. Uh, can you give us uh, uh, a, uh, a a case? In uh, could you tell us about a case in which you've done this? That would make it so realistic. That would be useful. Uh, with the exercises, um, yeah. I think. I th I th let me sort of go back to where we were. We have plenty of time. If that's possible, it'd be yeah. Sure. Um, I'll just list the exercises. These are the exercises. Yeah. Um, and the, the big one that's coming up um, in the next month is in Cambridge. There is a place called the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. They have already done a trial exercise on participation of biotechnology risk a couple of months ago, and they thought it was sufficiently interesting that they're now going to run a, a larger scale exercise involving experts, about a dozen experts from around the world. Um, and I, I and uh, I'm expecting that this will be a pretty significant bit of work uh, because we're tech, it's it's a it's an issue that the people are themselves in their workplace seriously addressing. It's not um, just something out of vital interest. For example, USA Post 2020 was an exercise I um, imagined simply to pretest the the process. Um, the UN gender and uh, the UN and gender policy one was an interesting one because that was about a large unnamed UN organisation that had a gender policy and they had an evaluation team wanting to find out how well that had worked out. And so the evaluation team did something very interesting. They started off an exercise and the seed of the story was about a person who had just joined the, this UN agency and his or her name was Ari. And we don't know whether it was a male or female, but in the subsequent storylines, these were about what happened to this person. So it literally was a fiction. It wasn't about a real person. It was a fictional story, multiple branching fictional story of this person who joined this organization and their experiences with gender discrimination and attempts to resolve it and interpersonal relations. And Having done that, that, that those storylines, after being evaluated by the participants themselves, were also evaluated by a wider constituency in that organisation. Um, I'm not privy to well, I, I'm not privy to the details of that, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk about them if if I was. But basically, it was, I think, a very imaginative uh, way of um, looking at the past through a fictional exercise, where people were able to project out onto those storylines some very sensitive and uh, contentious uh, uh, experiences. That's interesting, and I suppose uh, the the real purpose of this is to sensitize people to the various uh, paths that uh, can can possibly develop and uh, so that they're, they, they're just aware of the possibilities that could happen. Not only aware of them, but start thinking about if they're in right. the future, how they're going to adapt to those possibilities, how, what they can do in advance, what they can do after the event. Uh, that, I think, is the, is the missing part of the process at the moment, which is essentially a, a, a not really built into the app. It's, it's, it's a matter of getting people together after the evaluation process and saying, how are you going to respond to these likely but undesirable futures? What can you do in advance? How could you respond after the event? It's this adaptation, this adaptive, adaptive response, which mm -hmm. I think is the, the key final ingredient to it. Mm -hmm. Do people keep these uh, a record of this work for future uh, use and to remind themselves of the possibilities? 
the platform uh, keeps all exercises intact and uh, you can also download about a dozen different data sets about each exercise not a dozen i think about seven or eight different data sets about each exercise so all the data from each exercise including the evaluation judgments is kept on record it can be archived uh, it can be shared um, uh, amongst the participants or a wider constituency, depending on the wishes of the facilitator. Yeah. Do they do they uh, uh, take it out of the uh, uh, out of the computer and maybe put a big graphic up someplace in the office where they can remember it? Um, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. That would be interesting. You have it there as a reminder, visual reminder of these are the paths that could occur and. Well, one example, uh, one organization um, which did it as an input to a strategic planning exercise. Uh, this is early in the early last year. And uh, in the storylines, there were various uh, comments about when a vaccine would be become available uh, in, in, in more than one storyline. And uh, interestingly enough, none of the storylines anticipated the vaccine becoming available as early uh, as it did. Uh, which just, um, which I think was was one of many interesting things about that exercise. Yeah, well, that brings up another question: uh, Is it do comp do do groups come back to the the work they've done and 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 go over it again and start a new storyline uh, to see how that works? Um, I, not, none have come back and well, none have come back and reworked the existing uh, exercise. But I think uh, it's entirely feasible that an organisation would come back and start a new exercise, uh, looking again. For, well, if they could start a new exercise with a totally new seed, or they could take something from one of the existing storylines as a seed and develop the exercise from there. Yeah, this what is the seed actually? The seed is the first paragraph, the, the first paragraph on the first page of the book. I see, I see. You know, if you think of that tree structure that I showed you earlier, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, this is very impressive work, Rick. Uh, anybody else have questions for Rick? Uh, we've got uh, we don't have that many people here. Well, well, we've got more people than I expect at 9 30 at night or whatever it is, uh, from your time. Um, I don't know where you are, you're in the states, are you? I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in DC, yes. All right, uh, okay, it's not quite so late in the day then. Nicole, okay. do you have a question? Maybe you could unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, the computers may be on, but they may be elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, 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 I've been happy to have this opportunity, so that's that's fine from my point of view. Uh, your questions and those of Annette's were, were, were good in their own right. Good. Well, I thank you so much, Rick. This was really uh, enlightening. I've learned a lot. Okay. Check it out. Uh, go to powerevo.org. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Let's call it a day. Okay. Bye.